I knew I wanted to be a scientist all my life. My parents were scientists. I really liked science. Originally, I thought I might be an anthropologist, you know, dig up dinosaur bones like every boy desires to do. When I started university, I actually I did some time in a lab when they were actually studying bacteria that cause disease. Really, it was that time that I just got got the bug as the pun goes sort of thing. That the fact that these microbes, that these single-celled organisms could actually really wreak havoc in people. And I knew I always wanted to work on something that if I had results, I could actually improve the world we live in. Oh, the fascinating world of microbes. You can't see them, but they're everywhere. We are really coated in microbes everywhere our bodies expose the environment. The total number of bacteria in and on us outnumbers the total number of human cells by a factor of 10. I always tell my students, you're more microbial than you are human in that sense. We've learned a lot about how microbes work. Lab philosophy has always been to find a problem, solve that problem, and then you know apply that problem for the, for the benefit of, of the good of people. So we've been working on E. coli 147 for many years, trying to figure out how it actually sticks to the intestine. And then we made a, a really major discovery. What we realized, the bacteria come along, and they actually have this kind of a syringe, and they actually poke into the intestinal cell. It's kind of like if you're rock climbing, you would you know, hammer in a piton and then hang on to it. And the bacteria can then come along to it here. That really shook the world up. But then came the question, well, what do we do about it? The thing is, not all that many kids get this disease. The idea that vaccinate every school children in Canada, it just wouldn't get accepted. So, I was out for a run in the endowment lands here at UBC. Um, lovely place to go and think and stuff. And I was running along and suddenly, I literally tripped when this light went on that cows carry 0157. They don't get sick, but they carry it. And all human disease comes from basically contaminated water, the cows defecating and then going into the water source, or from when you grind up cows to make hamburger, you get fecal contamination. So if cows didn't carry it, you should decrease disease. So that was really what led us down this whole road. I called up a friend in Saskatchewan, Andy Potter, who worked with 157 and cows, said, hey Andy, why don't you try vaccinating with this stuff and let's see if we block it. So they did, and it worked. And you know, 10 years later, it was a licensed vaccine. The question comes, who pays for it? Because the cows carry the 157, but they don't get sick. So Mr. Farmer has no desire to vaccinate his cows because they're not getting sick. It is starting to be adopted, but it's much slower than I ever thought. What we're now realizing in the last five years or so is these microbes play a phenomenal role in health too, all the bugs in and on us. And so there's going to be a major push in the future of understanding how these bugs influence our, our weight, influence our IQ. We have neat data in animals that these bacteria actually influence the, the, the intelligence and, and brain development. Um, epigenetics, personalized medicine, asthma, type 1 diabetes, all these things we are now finding are influenced by these bugs. So the future will be more towards, um, I think, tailoring the bugs in and on us and using that to actually make us healthier. My wife's a pediatrician and we had been using antibiotics in mice to shift the microbiota and then looking at infection. And she just made this off-the-cuff remark over dinner one night that, you know, kids that get antibiotics in the first year of life have much higher rates of asthma. I said, oh really? So then I went and started looking at the literature and that's true that um, antibiotics do increase the incidence of asthma. Um, kids born by cesarean section have a 20% higher rate of asthma than kids born by vaginal delivery. There was all these smoking guns that microbes play and roll in asthma, but no one had done the experiment. So we said, fine, let's roll up our sleeves and do the experiment, we're scientists. And so we then took some mice and basically fed them different antibiotics. And then we, then we used the mouse model of asthma and we induced asthma disease. And lo and behold, if it didn't work, I mean, different antibiotics will give you different levels of asthma. We had some antibiotics that just gave huge levels of asthma, just off the scale from the normal things, and others had no effect. Well, okay, that, that, that really argues that the bugs in these mice actually play roles in asthma. Asthma in mice is one thing, asthma in kids is another. So now we're involved in a major study of thousands of kids across the country. So what we're hoping to do is get to the stage where we can identify which bugs seem to be good and bad for predictors of asthma later on in life. And then we can ideally come up with some kind of therapeutics, you know, oh, you need to be shifted, you need these bugs, here, eat this, or, or do something here. It's all very futuristic right now, where, where we are is, is identifying these bugs. We've done it in mice, and so now we're looking to see what's the same in kids and use that knowledge to actually, I mean, ultimately I'm hoping we can impact on asthma because it's just a huge problem. Science these days is, is absolutely stunning what you can do. 
but it's not what can you do, it's what should you do. How do we use that knowledge intelligently to come up with real solutions? And that's where the push is in our field.